And we're just asking the question, how did we... Hello there, welcome to this next in our series of Bible studies. And we're just asking the question, how did we get to know about Jesus? Obviously, we said if you were alive at the time, you'd perhaps have heard him speaking. And certainly after his death and resurrection, you may have started going to the churches that uh, had been set up by the disciples and heard the letters that were being read that were sent by the disciples. Obviously, as time went by, a more permanent record was needed, especially as the early followers of Jesus, the first witnesses, uh, began to die, and you needed some sort of record that could last. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke developed it. We've looked at Mark and Matthew over the last couple of weeks, and today we turn our attention to Dr. Luke. And we know he's a doctor, because elsewhere in the New Testament he's referred to as the physician. Assuming that that's the Luke that we're talking about. Like the other Gospel writers, we're not entirely sure who exactly Luke was. We think the Gospel was written sometime between AD 60 and AD 100, probably. Irenaeus refers to it, but much later on. We do know, though, and the tradition seems to link up to this, that Luke accompanied Paul on some of his missionary journeys. In fact, Paul refers to him. And so there is the tradition that some of these stories will have come via that experience. But again, perhaps a bit like Matthew, there may have been a school of Luke that developed and brought all these fragments together. And might have explained the interesting introduction to both Luke's Gospel and to the Acts of the Apostles. You see, with those two books, Luke was responsible for 28% of the New Testament. And all the clever books are very comfortable with the idea that he was actually responsible for both. Both of them start off in the same way, addressed to someone called Theophilus, which might have been a real person, but is the Greek form the lover of God. But at the start of Luke he writes, I do this so that you will know the full truth about everything that you have been taught. It's reasonable to assume that Theophilus probably wasn't a Jew, and certainly the way Luke's constructed the Gospel, the material that he selected, he's always at pains to explain what the various Jewish rituals and ceremonies meant. So it was likely that he was writing for a non-Jewish audience. He's described by many commentators as a, a historian who takes great care with his sources. And his main purpose is to talk about Jesus as bringing salvation, not simply the salvation of Israel, but the salvation of mankind. And maybe that's part of the way in which we see this as a gospel written to the non-Jewish world. It has various emphases that suggest that he was looking beyond fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy and addressing himself to a Greek or Hellenistic world that had slightly different priorities in life, as we will see, not least with money. Interestingly, Luke covers a number of stories that aren't in any of the other Gospels. The Ones about money, for example, include the shrewd manager who manages to write off a number of debts and make money out of it. Sounds a bit dishonest, but he was shrewd, which seems to be important. The parable of the lost coin features only in Luke. Um, the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, is only in Luke. And the teaching about humility and hospitality, when Jesus says, don't just invite people for a meal who will invite you back. Invite those who can't invite you back. Having a different attitude to money. And of course that fabulous story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's the tax collector, the one who's done bad things with money, who is acceptable before God because he is honest. The Pharisee dresses it up, but it's not right. But another emphasis that comes across is that Luke refers to many stories about second chances. Again, what we call the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son, only appears in Luke. And it's a second chance for somebody who's gone the wrong way. It's illustrated as well in the parable of the fig tree. And this fig tree that hasn't borne fruit for three seasons and 
the owner says, oh, chop it down the garden, says, no, give it another chance. And he puts manure around it and it grows. And then the third emphasis that I'd like to mention is for the marginalised. Luke, unique to the Gospel writers, talks very much about the role of women in the story. He talks about those who were ostracised by society, not least the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were the ones that, you know, you didn't talk to if you were a Jew. And yet it's the Samaritan who does the good deed. The religious people don't help the man who was attacked by robbers. Another story about a Samaritan that caught my eye was when Jesus healed ten people who had leprosy and only one came back. And he came back to say thank you. But it was a surprise for me to reread that story recently and see that the one who came back was actually the Samaritan. The woman who is described, we wouldn't use the term I suppose nowadays, but described as crippled, is the one that Jesus heals. And in the story of the widow and the judge, the persistent widow argues her case and eventually the judge concedes. Very interesting that in his selection of stories of Jesus, he's telling his community that money and second chances and those who are marginalised by society are questions that those who belong to the kingdom of God need to consider. These few short moments we can't possibly hope to do anywhere near justice to all the big themes that Luke covers. I haven't touched, for example, upon the birth narratives, quite interesting in themselves. They pick up some of the things we've already been talking about. It's the shepherds who feature in the story that Jesus tells us about the birth of Jesus and the fact that, therefore, the good news was for everybody, even the shepherds, who were considered, well, not the brightest in society. And it's also only Luke who talks about the boy Jesus going to the temple and discussing things with the, uh, the priests there and, and they being very impressed by his learning and understanding. Why did he select those stories? And why didn't he tell some of the other stories as well? Because they would have been around. He chose those because he wanted to demonstrate, I think, something about the humanity of Jesus. But also, he's a very theological writer, and part of his theology does mean that the gospel is for everybody, not just for the privileged, not just for the rich, not just for men. And so when you read Luke's gospel, you see him doing it as somebody who's concerned that we have as full a view as possible. And then alongside that, and this is perhaps a bit more speculative, but I do like it as an idea. He was a medic, a physician, and maybe there was something about that which means when he deals with the stories of healing, he's dealing with real people. He's telling us a bit about them each time. And part of the whole business of being a medic, you know, doing no harm, he recognises that what Jesus was doing was saying people matter enough to meet their needs not just to discard them. So, there you go. It's a much longer read than Mark's Gospel. I think that the fact that Matthew and Luke agreed on a lot of material suggests they had a common source as well as Mark. But there is a lot with from his own point of view. And it was those three questions about what's your attitude towards money? What's your attitude towards giving other people a second chance? And what's your attitude to those who society pushes to the edge that remains the challenge for us today? I don't believe that we should be doing Bible studies merely to discuss the intricacies of the Greek text. I think we should be doing them so that we can hear the authentic voice of Jesus speaking to us. Because that's how we learn about him. And what Luke has done for us in his gospel is selected material that astonishingly has enormous relevance 2,000 years on. Well, I've listened to some of this already and I've heard the birds sing in the background. I hope 
that was part of the pleasure. I didn't pull you off too much. But do take care of yourselves. Um, God bless you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye now.